So bonds will be irresistible as an asset for these whales because not only they have high yields attached to them, they also fulfill this diversification property for their portfolio, which is so, so important. So if we are really going here, Adam, with core inflation persistently below three, around two, and even in my opinion at 1%, you'll have insurance companies, pension funds, banks, asset managers, the big, big bond market whales, they will be coming in in size. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. Bond yields have come down recently, making November the best month for global bonds since 2008 and for U.S. bonds since 1985. Is this the start of a recovery in the bond market, which has been battered and bruised for the past three years running? Or is this just a temporary reprieve? To find out, we've got the good fortune to hear from bond expert Alf Pecatiello of the Macro Compass. Alf, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Adam, such a pleasure. And I'm very happy to be on your new channel. It looks awesome. And I'm very happy it's going well. Well, thank you. I'm so pleased that you could be one of the early minds on this channel. Alf, a lot of questions these days about bonds. So to have your expertise here early on, a great privilege for all of us. You're also a good friend. It's just always fun to talk to you and see you again. Thanks so much for making the time to talk to us all the way from Europe. Um, all right. I got a lot to go through and uh, not a ton of time because we're both capped here uh, with, with hard stops. Um, so let's dive right into it. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? I think we are in the phase of transition where people understand that inflation is going down. They think it is going down to the Federal Reserve target to 2%, I think they will be surprised that not only inflation goes down to 2%, but it goes below 2%. And that will mean that central banks not only will cut rates, but they will probably be even more aggressive than what the market is already pricing in. And at the first phase of this transition from, oh my God, this time is different. Inflation is sticky. It will never go away. That was 2022. Mm -hmm. When you make this transition into, oh, inflation is going to 2 and the next step will be, oh, inflation is actually going to be 1% at some point next year. At the early innings of this transition, people love it because the uncertainty out there in market gets taken away, Adam. I mean, you know, inflation is going down. The central bank is going to be predictable. They are going to cut rates. And all the negativity is going to be basically um, taken away. And, you know, companies that are under trouble will be rescued by a pivot from the Federal Reserve. That's the first inning of this transition. And the vibes might actually continue for a few months until everybody's really convinced that it's a soft landing with inflation at 1%, growth 1%, the Fed cutting rates, everybody's happy. I think there is a risk that the first phase morphs into excessive euphoria and therefore it traps people into aggressive positioning and it surprises them with a potential recession in 2024, which I don't hear almost anybody talking about as a possibility anymore. It seems like that everybody, their dog and their mother, believes that soft landing is the only way out. So my two most important messages are inflation will not only slow down to two, but below 2%. And when it does, there is actually a second potential lag of recessionary vibes that kicks in, which people will be completely ignoring and be completely unprepared for. Okay. Um, I talked to David Rosenberg a few weeks ago on this channel, and uh, it's a good company to be in, Alf. I think he sees things similar to you. He said that he expects inflation to have a one-handle uh, at some point in the second half of next year. Sounds like you, you think the same thing. He also expects a recession. And he said, of course, we're going to have a soft landing because you have to, the soft landing is a milestone on the way to the hard landing. <laughs> it sounds like you're saying something pretty similar. I mean, look, similar. The, uh, of course, we have to talk in probability terms and nobody is a crystal ball. And it's easy to say there will be a recession. It's much harder to say when, how hard of a recession. So I want to put some context here, Adam. And, um, Europe, for instance, has been growing or not growing at 0% pretty much for the entire year. UK real GDP and European real GDP has been pretty much 0% this year. So they're flirting with the recession. Same goes for Sweden. All the European continent is actually in trouble. 
but the market isn't really preoccupied by it, right? Because 0% growth with an employment rate mildly higher doesn't really scare markets, right? I mean, what markets get scared about is when people are seriously losing their jobs, companies right. are laying off, people can't spend, and there is a negative vicious loop that actually feeds into more unemployment, less growth. That's what markets are scared about. So we need to talk about the US specifically in this case, what are the chances that we're going to have a recession? How bad can it be? And when could it hit? And then we need to talk about this in the context of what the market is pricing, because that is important. You need to surprise markets to really generate this vicious sell-off. And I think by the first quarter of next year, you'll be in the perfect position where everybody has ridden this soft landing narrative. Everybody's happy. Everybody's in the pool swimming. The room is very crowded with the soft landing narrative. And so it's pretty easy to surprise markets negatively. I think the first quarter of next year might see this confluence. Okay. So um, <clears throat> presumably you feel that um, uh, the financial markets, let's say equities, might do actually pretty well for the next couple of months as everybody starts rejoicing, right? Oh, soft landing, we're seeing the data, inflation's come down to the Fed's target. Oh, it's going a little bit below. Oh, wow, we may go back to the, the happy salad days of you know Fed cutting and doing quantitative easing. Everyone's super excited. Um, how does that start morphing in your mind to the, um, you know, to the uh, dawning realization of, oh gosh, uh, this is actually, you know, economy is not just hitting the soft landing, but it's continuing to go down. And oh my gosh, maybe recession's hitting now. And, um, you know, especially if it considers there's thinking that the Fed is going to revert back to, um, to easing and bringing rates down, maybe it's not going to be worried for a little while, right? You know, maybe it's going to think oh, the Fed's going to ride to the rescue here. Now, of course, anybody who looks at a chart uh, of previous recession sees that they, they've all followed uh, the Fed aggressively hiking, then it hangs out at a plateau. And then as the Fed is cutting, the economy is falling into recession all along the way initially. Yeah. So look, I think, Adam, the key chart that I want to show people to start with here is a chart of why I believe inflation might actually be 1% somewhere in the middle of next year. And this chart that you can see here basically looks at the credit impulse on the left side of the chart and what happens to inflation 18 months later. So okay. this chart- you know, that... so, Sorry to interrupt, but if, if you could just define the credit impulse for folks Absolutely. that don't understand what it is, it's basically yes. the, the increase uh, of the increase uh, in, in credit, correct? Yes. So what we're trying to measure here is the amount of real economy spendable money so the amount of money that ends up in our pockets and in the corporate sector, the amount of money that get, gets spent in the real economy, in other words, and we're trying to measure whether it's increasing or decreasing rapidly. So the rate of change of real economy money creation, that's what we're trying to measure. It's a very powerful metric because the idea is, if you look at this metric in 2020, 2021, it went up very rapidly. And why? Governments from all over the world and banks from all over the world sponsored by governments were providing cheap money to the real economy. There was fiscal deficits. There was credit, which was sponsored by governments. In case losses would occur, the governments would take up some of the losses from banks. So there was a huge credit injection into the world. And 18 months later, remember, the power of this indicator is that it leads inflationary dynamics with 18 months. The idea is you print more money, the money goes into the real economy, it gets spent, and later on, as demand picks up, inflation finally shows up, right? And it did, because 18 months later, inflation did show up. So you had this one, and you have to recognize that if you print real economy money, inflation will show up 18 months later. Now, the problem is that at this point, you start hearing narratives of, this time is different, inflation is sticky, it will always be at 5 7 8%. The reality is that we stopped printing real economy money, Adam. The US did a one-off gigantic amount of fiscal spending, $5 trillion in a year. Then it did way less. Then it restarted again last year. The next year, it's likely to slow down again. Private sector credit creation, mortgage applications are at the lowest since the 90s. The private sector is not borrowing because interest rates are too high. Small cap 
borrowing rates are almost 10%. So effectively, the private sector says, I don't want more credit. I am going to stop asking for credit, asking for real economy money to spend. And so you get this downside here. And very punctually, 18 months later, you get inflation that starts to follow this downward path as well, because you started, you stopped printing money aggressively. Now, this orange line here, the credit impulse, gives us a head start on the next 18 months. So it allows us to look forward, in other words. And if I look at what the model says it should happen by June 2024, it says that not only inflation is going to stop 2%, but it's probably going to be below. One and zero are actually a possibility. Now, this is headline inflation. If you look at core inflation, that means you can expect core inflation to range around 1% to 1.5%. Those are low levels, below the Federal Reserve target. That's where you start. And right now, market is focusing on the, the positive note of it. The positive note is that inflation will slow down and the Fed can cut rates. And because growth isn't collapsing yet, everything is nice and dandy. That looks a lot like 2019. 2019, inflation slowed down to below 2%. Powell pivoted very aggressively early January 2019, ultimately ended up cutting rates in summer of 2019 to try and accommodate the easing. The economy didn't really collapse. Job growth was low. Earnings per share were 0% in 2019. But because we really didn't collapse in growth terms and inflation ended up low and the Fed cut rates, the market was pretty happy about it. And I think that's what we are living right now, Adam. This feeling that everything is going to land very smoothly, inflation is going to go down, the Fed's going to cut rates, and growth is going to hold. This is where we start. I don't think we end here, though. Okay, yeah, and uh, and talking about ending, so um, uh, I I can imagine that at the uh, I keep thinking about the end of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? When the the, the Nazis open the Ark of the Covenant uh, and they are talking to God, they think, and everything looks great, and then all of a sudden the angels morph into the uh, angels of death, and all of a sudden they realize they they got what they wanted. It just wasn't what they were hoping for, right? Um, and I feel like you think that's the kind of year that that at least equity investors may have next year as they begin to realize, oh, my gosh, uh, yeah, we've gotten inflation under control, but now we're kind of worried about deflation, right? Um, on the flip side, it sounds like it should be a really good year for bond investors, at least for sovereign bond investors like U.S. Treasury holders, Um because interest rates are highly tied to inflation expectations. If folks stop inspecting, expecting inflation, maybe start thinking of, of extremely low or even negative inflation rates. Wow, you know, got to get me the safety of some of these treasuries. And, and they expect the Fed to be out there now doing quantitative easing and, and back buying treasuries. It's historically been the biggest buyer. It's been sitting out the past couple of years. Um, we could expect uh, treasuries to do quite well. Um, I remember the last time we talked, before we even had this this credit impulse chart, um, you were saying that when the Fed was forced to change, you expected it to be very aggressive, like to go yeah. back to ZERP, uh, or at least go very uh, aggressively in that direction. Do you still feel that same way? Yes, I do. So the idea is that people think the process works linearly. So they think that, Inflation went up. Ah, it didn't really go up linearly, did it? It was pretty vicious on the way up. But people forget that. And they say, well, inflation went up. And now inflation is going to go down very predictably and linearly. And it's all going to stop at 2%. And everybody's going to be happy. The problem is, when you apply rapid changes to such a complex system like our monetary system, things are hardly linear, Adam. So when you shake that system with a lot of money printing, a lot of money unprinting, which is basically what we have been doing now for a while, in my opinion, the risk of convex nonlinear reactions are pretty high. And so when you look at bond markets today, you can split bond yields in a few ways to understand how they work and what level of bond yields you can reach at some point. And so two useful uh, ways of splitting 10-year treasury yields, for example, you can think of them as 10-year real interest rates plus 10-year inflation expectations. So that's one way. You take a nominal yield and you divide it into a real yield and an inflation expectation component. 
Okay, so today 10-year interest rates are about 4%, a bit higher, 420, something along these lines. And the way that this is split is that inflation expectation are about 225 and real interest rates are about 2%. That is the split today. When you look at next year, what happens? Well, if I'm right on inflation, then not only inflation expectations will be a two, but probably even a little bit below that, okay? So on the yield perspective, you get a bit of tailwinds if you're long bonds by the fact that inflation comes down. But most importantly, real yields today are at 2%. 2% real yields means that the market is expecting the Federal Reserve to keep real Fed funds positive effectively for the next 10 years. Now, positive Fed, real Fed funds is a, a restrictive stance from the Federal Reserve. It means they're keeping Fed funds above the level of inflation consistently for the next 10 years. This is very different from what we saw from prior to pandemic levels when inflation was very low. The Federal Reserve was trying to stimulate every time this inflationary process. And people now, th now think that despite the fact that inflation will come down, the Federal Reserve will keep real interest rates markedly positive for the next 10 years. So it takes just a bit of this change where people say, well, you know what? 2% real yields. Can the economy really take it? Because inflation is tanking. Growth is coming down. Maybe we should reassess the fact that this is not very different from before the pandemic. That maybe the US economy can handle 0.5%, maybe 1% real yields, but that's it. So then you get a double whammy your way. Real yields come down. There is an, basically a reassessment of where real yields should be, and inflation expectations also come down. The combination of the two can easily be worth another 100 basis points. So from 4%, all of a sudden, you can be at 3 And the most important part of it all is who are the whales that are going to come and buy bonds? And this is something I would like to explain to people because I have worked in the bond market as a professional for a bank. And when I hear people on Twitter or on YouTube or on any other social media discussing big buyers of bond markets, it always comes up to two guys. The Federal Reserve is considered to be a whale and let's say foreign central banks. So the Chinese or the Japanese are seen to be the big whales of the bond market. And I want to show some data, Adam, if you agree with me, that shows that the big whales in the bond markets are some unsuspicious guys that are called pension funds, insurance companies, banks, and asset managers. These are huge whales that have been dormant for a couple of years, but they could come back in big, big size in 2024. And we can explain why. Right, great. So banks and shadow banks. And this is exactly where I was going to go with you, Alf, because if investors start thinking that, um, okay, today's tasty yields are going to start going away and the bonds themselves are going to appreciate in price as those yields come down, I want to lock those puppies in now. So it sounds like you're saying, hey, these whales may step in and start buying kind of hand over fist while the time is right. Yes, I think you're perfectly on the ball there. But most importantly, we should explain, can I share the screen for a second? So I want to I wanna share something that people should pay attention to, I think. So this chart is key for macro in 2024. It shows the, the stock bond correlation, which you can see here on this side of the axis, against the average level of core inflation. So let me explain how this works, okay? If core inflation is above 3%, so we are going in this area of the chart, the correlation between stocks and bonds is positive. And the big whales hate this, Adam, because the big whales, like a pension fund, the pension fund has equities and risk assets and credit spread and a lot of things because they need to generate returns so that they can pay the future pensions, okay? They need to take risks. Now, why do they buy bonds? They buy bonds because they want a negative cor correlation asset to their equities, right? They want equities to try and generate returns, and they want bonds as a safe stabilizer of their portfolio. So they want the negative correlation here. Problem is that when core inflation is above 3%, historically, and this chart looks at 200 years of history, 
you end up with a positive correlation like in 2022. So bonds go down, equities go down, credits go down, everything goes down. And these whales are basically unable to buy more bonds because their entire portfolio is going down. So they stay away and they say, sorry, this is a bad period. I can't do much. But now if core inflation goes below 3%, that's where we are now. Remember, core inflation is going fast there. I say it's going to one, okay? That's very low. But let's say it goes to two. What happens? Look at all these points. Your correlation becomes negative. And so that becomes amazing for these pension funds because they can have the equity position in their portfolios and they can say, what? I have 10-year treasuries at 4%. That's a very respectable yield to buy for my future pensions to pay. And on top of it, because core inflation is low, the negative correlation between bonds and stocks will come back. So bonds will be irresistible as an asset for these whales because not only they have high yields attached to them, they also fulfill this diversification property for their portfolio, which is so, so important. So if we are really going here, Adam, with core inflation persistently below three, around two, and even in my opinion, at 1%, You'll have insurance companies, pension funds, banks, asset managers, the big, big bond market whales. They will be coming in in size. And do you want to know the size? The size can be gigantic. This is a chart from Goldman Sachs. So Goldman Sachs looked at the amount of net buying or net selling in the treasury market from the 70s until today. It basically looks at all the flows that are going through the treasury market and it measures where are they coming from? Who are the whales? Who are the biggest buyers of the bond market? And so I would like people to pay attention to the Federal Reserve up here. That's the, the light blue share. 14%, 6%, 14%, 7%, 15%. That's not a whale. That's a buyer of bonds. Fair enough, but it is not a whale. 2020, 2021, the Federal Reserve bought 56%. That's a whale. But that is a very concentrated quantitative easing time, right? That was the Fed doing QE to help the Treasury with their big fiscal deficit issuance, okay? If you go 50 years back, the Federal Reserve has accounted roughly for 15%. Do you want to know who are the whales? Look no further than my red boxes in here. Pension funds, mutual funds, and other asset managers foreign investors, which of course also include China and Japan, but this is mostly foreign pension funds, foreign asset managers. These are the big, big whales in the bond market. They account historically for 70% of the flows in the bond market. And recently, Adam, they have been dormant. Look at them. They haven't really participated recently. They've stayed away exactly because of this positive correlation, because they couldn't really afford buying more bonds. If bonds were going down, equities were going down, they were taking a hit from anywhere in markets. But hey, if you get this negative correlation back, the whales will be back next year in the bond market. So, Alf, this is fascinating. So on this chart here, yeah, when, when we were in the red zone, when inflation was above 4%, they couldn't diversify away their risk, right? That's correct. So they, 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 it, was, it was game off for bonds, right? So if, if you can go back to the other chart, of yeah. your your red boxes there, um, you know the big buyers, right? You said basically went game off. Well, now they're going to flip to game on, right? But think about this too: um, consumers, you know, they're not quite as smart as the institutional guys, but but they're not dumb. They're going to say, "Hey, you know what? Like we've been buying a lot of these bonds because we're getting much better yields than we were getting on our, our from our bank accounts." But yeah, maybe this game is going to be over soon. So I still want to lock in this stuff while it's there. So they're probably going to keep buying. And then to your point, if the Fed is now getting involved because it's now beginning to worry about a recession, then the Fed becomes another buyer. It becomes basically game on for everybody. <laughs> so not only you get the big, big whales, but the problem is who's the marginal seller right here? Because households, which locked in in 2022, 2023, households were the whales, they were the guys looking at these yields, 4 or 5%, and they said, yeah, give it to me, man. Well done, by the way, guys, because on average, you have locked in good rates. You are the blue line over here, okay? So maybe you haven't bought 30 years treasuries, but you have bought front-end bonds and locked in good rates. But at some point, if you see that inflation is going down next year, and if you see that things are normalizing, 
and you even start wondering, yeah, maybe maybe we might fall into a recession, you are not going to sell your bonds. So it starts to become really a very concentrated market where the negative correlation between stock and bonds start to exist again. It attracts the big whales. But where are the sellers of bonds? That's my question. Once inflation starts consistently going below 2%, Adam, I think it becomes a rush to an asset class, which has gone down a lot for two years in a row, almost three years in a row, starts to get a bit hated. But the reality is that the whales will be coming back next year. So you should pay attention. So I'll let me get your reaction to this. So there's a narrative right now that, um, oh, there's a supply issue in the, an oversupply issue in the U.S. Treasury market, mm. right? Where, you know, Janet Yellen Treasury is just, you know, issuing them galore and and buyers, you know, foreign buyers most often mentioned, but, you know, um, are less interested. Um, it sounds like you don't, certainly think that's going to be the case next year. I'd be curious if you think it's even the case now, but it sounds like what I hear from you is, yeah, we're going to have a supply issue next year, but it's going to be, I, folks can't get them. <laughs> there is no I marginal think, seller. I think that's what's going to happen because everybody looks at the supply, but nobody looks at the demand for bonds. So everybody can say the treasury is issuing more. Yeah, sure. You just go on the treasury website and you look at the, the, the size of the issuance. Ask yourself who's interested to buy bonds. And now I showed you a chart that says that the, the biggest whale, which represents 70% of the purchase power in bond markets, might actually have a very strong interest in buying bonds next year. And the bond market this year has managed to close the year, ah, it's not closed yet, but almost, about flat, despite some big, big issuance that has come to the market, right? Remember August, September, October, all this narrative. The bond market is about to close the year flat, and the whales haven't shown up yet. So my point to you is, you're wondering about supply next year. I'm wondering about demand, because if the chart I showed you before with the negative correlation actually kicks in, then I can guarantee that the whales will be coming back. So supply is always easy to talk about. You can always say, this is the number, this is the trillion in deficits, this is the supply coming. Sure, that's true. But ask yourself, where is the demand going to come from? And next year, I can make a couple of points by, by which the whales will be showing up again. And that demand can be really, really powerful. Well, and I wonder if the worm hasn't turned yet and we just haven't gotten the memo because of that point you just mentioned, which is for most of this year on this, uh, you know, on, on my interviews, um, you know, I've been pointing out the fact that we were highly likely looking like we were going to have a third down year for the treasury bond market, which would have been historically unprecedented, never happened since the 1700s. Um, and I think, you know, up until a couple of weeks ago, you know, that was going to, it was taken pretty much as a given for this year. Now, yeah. because of the, the fact that yields have come down, we're now, as you said, we're pretty much back to flat, kind of heading green for the year. So we may not get that unprecedented yep. third year, right? That's true. And as you That's said, true. the whales and all the other buying stuff that we just talked about, that hasn't happened yet. That, that shoe hasn't dropped yet. And that obviously would put rocket fuel on the upward trajectory here for bond prices. So yeah. I don't know, you know, may, may, maybe... Maybe despite the the dominant narrative right now of too many treasuries out there, and oh, this could be another bad year for bonds next year, uh, because this year was the third bad year, that's that's fast dissipating. Well, first, I'm not sure this year is the third bad year. As you say, well, exactly. we, are closing, yeah. we are closing the year indeed uh, at the moment pretty much flat on bonds. So it's not too bad, to be honest. And next year, it's uh, actually shaping up to be possibly a very good year. Uh, let's make another split of 10-year treasury yield. So I said before, we're at 425 now. I can easily see us being at 3% somewhere next year. So that's a lot of yield drop. And as you know, mm -hmm. yields are inversely related to prices. That means bond prices will be going up if I am correct. But the other way to split it is you can think of a 10-year treasury yield as all the future Fed funds over the next 10 years so we start now at 525%, but what will be the Fed funds at the end of next year? And then at the end of year two, and then at the end of year three, and so on and so forth. So you can think of decomposing them like this. And then you can think of term premium. And term premium is a, is a scary word. You know, people are like, sometimes they hear this thing, term premium. What the hell is that? And so I want to explain why if you also do this decomposition, you end up to 
possibly the same answer. 10-year treasury yields might as well go to 3%. So if you bear with me for a second, I would like to um, share again a couple of charts with your audience. Excellent. So look, here is the number of cuts priced by December 2025. That's the orange line here. And it's basically cuts over the next two years, okay? By between today and the end of December 25. And we are going fast to 200 basis point of interest rate cuts priced in the next two years. Okay, so the Fed is priced to cut from 525 to 325 in the next two years. That still sees no recession, Adam. Let's make that clear. Because mm -hmm. if there is a recession, the Federal Reserve will cut actually 300 basis point in one year, not two years. So in two years, we'll be fast at zero. So this right. doesn't assume a recession. This assumes a soft landing. Yeah? And, and sorry, just to interject for one second. Um, if you look at the current dot, pot, dot plot offered by the Federal Reserve, it projects this very graceful decline over the next yeah. five years. Uh, I'm not sure what it is exactly in the last one, but one of the most recent ones I saw, it was like down to 2.6% or so by you know five years from now, right? Yeah. And you're basically saying a lot of reasons to expect we could get down a heck of a lot further, a heck of a lot faster. And that wouldn't be a surprise to guys like you who followed the Fed for many years because the Fed projections are notoriously wrong. <laughs> October October 2007, they told me that growth in 2008 will be plus two and a half percent. Sure, we all know how 2008 turned out to be. Not really two and a half percent growth, unfortunately. Right. And, so and more recently, really everybody thing. remembers how you know transitory inflation was going to be. You know, when so, they were. Look, Adam. I mean, I don't listen to Fed predictions that much, but this is bond market pricing over here, right? And bond market is saying, look, 200 basis point of pricing. You can already see here a 10-year Treasury yields in blue pretty much follow the pricing of Federal Reserve cuts, right? So as I said before, you can think of 10-year Treasury yields as the Fed funds that will be prevailing at year one, year two, year three, year four. So if the market starts pricing in cuts, obviously 10-year Treasury yields will converge to that. And if you price 200 basis point of cuts, which again has nothing to do with the recession, it's just soft lending, these inflationary cuts, you can already see 10-year Treasuries at 380, 375%. Mm -hmm. This is the relationship. Now, the other co component to consider is term premium. Term premium measures the uncertainty around this path. So if you buy 10-year treasuries, what you're getting exposure to is interest rate risk. So if interest rates move higher, the duration risk that is in a 10-year bond, in a third-year bond is pretty high. For a change of uh, interest rates of 10 basis point, the price move, in other words, of a 10-year or a 30-year bond is very large. Okay, So the duration risk, the interest rate risk is large. So what you want as an investor instead, it's not all this volatility. You want a predictable stream of cash flows. As a retired guy, you want to buy 10-year treasuries at 5%. You want no volatility around it, ideally, right? And you want your coupons clipped in every year, every year, every year, every year, in a predictable fashion. If price swings around a lot, eh, you will demand some compensation for it, right? For all this volatility. And this compensation is term premium, okay? So as you can see in October, term premium skyrocketed higher. Why? Ah, oh, this time is different. You know, something is changing. There is so much supply of bonds. Nobody will buy them. And look at inflation. It is so sticky. Of course, I'm mocking now because all of this turned out not to be true, but this was the narrative at that point. So the term premium had gone higher, 10-year rates had gone higher as a result of all this uncertainty that people wanted to be rewarded for. But now, what uncertainty are we talking about, Adam? Inflation is going fast to 2%, growth is slowing down, the labor market is slowing down, the Fed is going to cut. It all sounds pretty predictable, right? So people will be demanding less compensation for this uncertainty. And here I put a green area that shows what the term premium was on average between 2016 and even during 21, 22. Well, term premium was negative. People don't want to be paid for any uncertainty because there has never been any uncertainty, really. Inflation was predictable and growth was low. And if we go back even partially into this regime, 10-year treasury yields can drop another 50, 75 basis points. So 375 minus 50, again, 3 to 325. That's the base case for me where 10-year treasury yields 
might go next year. And this does not account for a recession. It does not account yet for a recession. Huh? So three, 325, you can see us getting there kind of under status quo scenarios. You throw a recession in, obviously, though, and that those yields get even lower pretty faster. Yeah. That's true. Because if you get a recession, as we said, in a normal uh, recession, the Federal Reserve over the first 12 months cuts rates by about 250 to 300 basis points. And in the successive 12 months, so in two years total, the Fed ends up cutting rates by at least 400 basis points. So that is much faster of a cutting cycle than the one that is priced here. If you get a recession, in other words, 10-year treasury yields go 2% or slightly below. So that's still a lot to go. But even if you don't assume a recession, those 425% yields you're looking at today or even better, the 5% yields you were given in October are actually a very good thing to have in your portfolio. And the whales might be looking at yields and correlations with the stock market next year, and they might be thinking, whoa, if I didn't participate so far, it's time to be back. It's time to buy bonds because not only I can lock in a 425% um, yield in my portfolio, but I can get this diversification property again working for my portfolios next year. So whales are generally slow, and that's the advantage that retail investors have. Thanks to channels like you, they get good information, good analysis, and they can act relatively quickly. They don't have to go through an investment committee of any sort, right? So if you think that whales are coming back, why don't be this small fish that gets in a little bit earlier than the whales? That's a great way to put it. That is one of the advantages in the story right now for us little guys. We don't we don't get that many advantages versus the big guys, but this is one. So, um, Alf, um, obviously, you are pretty optimistic about bond prices going forward. Um, we've spent most of the time talking about uh, sovereign bonds here, specifically U.S. Treasuries. Um, probably similar dynamics in the corporate space, although you have corporate risk to factor in there. And if a recession hits, that may hit some of these companies that issue private debt um, or corporate debt. Um, so uh, I, I guess the question I want to ask you is, is, is you've had a, you know, your whole career has been uh, investing in bonds. How attractive is this moment in time versus what you've seen so far in your career? Wow, that's a good question. Can you ask me that question a month ago? I would have said it, it <laughs> looks awesome. You know, 5% <laughs> guaranteed 10-year treasury yield is a good thing to have. 425 is still pretty attractive. For a 425% 10-year yield to turn out to be a bad investment, the world needs to be materially, materially different than before the pandemic. So that means organic growth, much stronger than before the pandemic. But Adam, I don't see demographics changing for the better. I actually see China losing hundreds of millions of workers over the next decades. So their one-child policy is actually playing against them over the next few decades. I see demographics everywhere else in the world not looking particularly good. Productivity, we have been there a few times and it's like 1% a year. We become a bit more productive each year. That's okay. But unless you believe that artificial intelligence is going to be this... Uh, you know, world-changing technology, and it has to act immediately that yeah, way. And quickly, yeah. <laughs> and quickly, right? You're not going to get the tailwind there as well. So I, I really don't see why equilibrium interest rates for developed economies should be higher. How can the European economy, how can the UK economy have interest rates, equilibrium interest rates, materially higher than prior to the pandemic? I really don't see the point. So if you don't see that sea change, really, then all of a sudden, 425% compared to the usual 25 maybe 3% yield you were given, it's still a relatively attractive entry level, I would say. All right, good. And you know, you talked about how your thesis plays out um, even in a world of, of no recession. Uh, for the reasons you mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, it sounds like you do expect a recession next year. Just curious, um, how gut feel, or based on your current calculations, um, how, how how would you rate the recession you expect? Garden variety, extra bad, extra mild? A really uh, a good question. And I think that the answer is um, 
garden variety is, is a good answer. Uh, I would expect that the labor market takes a hit, which is worse than people expect. At the moment, people expect no hit. They expect the nothing. Market. Yeah. So anything would nothing. be more than they expect. Yeah. So uh, I think, for example, saying stuff like unemployment rate might go up to 6%. It's not a ridiculously high level, but 6% is a few people will be losing their jobs. Okay. And why do I say that? The hiking cycle so far has not impacted corporate America at all. Actually, it has benefited corporate America on the net basis, which is ridiculous. And why? Because corporate America locked in very cheap borrowing rates before the Fed hiked. So they did so in 2019, 2020, 2021. They borrowed for 10 years, in other words, at very low interest rates, which means their refinancing needs in 2022 and 2023 so far have been very, very limited. The pass-through, in other words, of the Federal Reserve hiking cycle has been slow for corporate America. But they've got the benefit of investing their cash at 5%. So it's really funny. Basically, they've got some positive effect so far for some reason. But if you wait long enough, and this is how the macro lags really work, there will be more debt that comes to refinance. And that happens already in 2024. In Europe, really rapidly. In the US, it keeps happening over time. Yeah, those corporates all of a sudden will need to refinance their debt at much higher rates. And as the Fed cuts interest rates, their benefit on cash investments dwindles. So they start getting the negative side of a tightening cycle, which is what they should get in the first place. That was the intention. But because of the structure of corporate America borrowing, it's taken a longer time. And I think when it kicks in, people will be surprised that these corporates which, by the way, don't wait until the last moment. They make plans, right? They look at how much they need to refinance, and it will be like, ooh. Uh, you got to start cutting costs should... now, yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe my pile of earnings, which isn't really increasing, by the way. So it's, it's like a stable pie of earnings, okay? Where do I allocate it? Well, now I have this amount of wages and this amount of production costs, et cetera. And then they, next year, they need to add the big, big slice to that pie, which is refinancing costs, servicing my debt. It becomes much more expensive. It takes a larger portion of the pie. And the pie is always the same. So you got to cut somewhere, Adam. And I think people will be surprised that companies will be saying, I don't need all these people. Maybe I can shed 10% of my workforce. Mm -hmm. Then 10% here, 10% there, 10% there. It starts to sum up. Already now you see that hires, private sector hires in the JOLTS report are coming back down already to 2019 levels. And we aren't yet at the point where the refinancing starts to be felt. That happens somewhere gradually in 2024. So I think people will be surprised by the fact that the labor market can weaken more than they think today. Yeah, and you know, there's so much that I think is tied to the future of the labor market, housing being a really good example, um, where we have these kind of, frozen markets or markets that have sustained at levels much longer than people thought. And I think for many of them, one of the key underlying reasons for that is that the employment situation hasn't really changed that much. But if that really does start to change, especially for the negative, like you might think, maybe it cracks open the pace of change and some of these other things. All right. Well, I'm going to start wrapping up here, um, Alf, just because we, we both have uh, our constraints here. Um, but uh, I can't let you go without uh, asking you two things. Uh, one, you've got a great free resource for folks that are or not free resource, but a great resource for folks to let them know about. Um, before we get there, though, real quick, I just want to ask you uh, your market outlook and for next year, which I think we've captured the spirit of where I think you think the markets are going to have a pretty rough, the, the equity markets are going to have a rough time next year while the bond markets do well. Um, but specifically, are there any other assets besides uh, you you know sovereign debt right now that you think are good assets to be considering given how you think 2024 is going to play out? So I think for the next few months, there are certain emerging markets which are still cheaply valued with very good stories behind. And uh, I think Poland is a very interesting case. Poland is a very productive country which now has a solid government, new elections. So basically my point is look beyond the United States. There are opportunities that are somewhere else in markets that are still cheaply valued. And then the other investment I would do, uh, and I know you start asking this question to your guests, so I'm going to anticipate uh, you there and answer this question already, because we always talk about money and investments and finance and stuff, but there are things you can do to become a better uh, uh, investor and a more efficient person in your life. 
And one of it would be to invest in your own communication skills. Mm. So if I look at people in the job market, in general, negotiating with other people, presenting, communication skills are highly underrated. People don't work on them, both when it comes to verbal communication and written communication. It will fast track anything you do in life because an effective communication is uh, the ability of delivering ideas that are in your brain and everybody has amazing ideas, but being able to package them and communicate them effectively to people, it's a superpower. It's really a superpower. So I would invest in that. That is fascinating. And you did correctly anticipate where I was going. So thank you. Um, and communication skills, I, I, I couldn't agree more, especially as a guy in media. Um, but to your point, you know, a, a vision can be great, but if you can't get people to understand it and get on the bandwagon, then it's just sort of stalled at the starting line. So um, I'm, I, I wasn't expecting that one, but I think it's a great one. Um, all right. Well, so Alpha, I, I gave a quick little hint, um, but you have a bond course that you have packaged for today's retail investor. And given that you just basically spent the past hour telling us that you think there's a great uh, year up ahead for bonds, uh, tell people more about that course. Look, guys, uh, the course works like this. The bond market scares people away. It's full of jargon and full of technicalities, but I wanted to end that for people so that people could really master this complicated market. So you can do that by buying my bond market course. It's four hours of material. You can download slides, you can buy it and then watch it at any time. It's really handy. And how do you do that? Well, you go in the link that I think Adam will put somewhere below the YouTube in the description. So it's easy to I, get. I will put it in the description immediately below this video, folks. But most importantly, most importantly, because you're listening to this awesome channel and you're staying with us for an hour, I'm going to throw at you a very special discount. 20% off using the code Adam, pretty easy. 20% off, but only if you are within the first 50 people to purchase the course. So take advantage of the offer, use the link below, put the discount code Adam and buy the bond market course. All right, great. Super timely. Thank you for giving my audience that additional discount, Alf. Um, real quick before I let you go, um, in addition to the course, which everybody should go check out, uh, if people want to follow your regular work, uh, where should they go? So they can start from Substack. I have a free Substack that goes out about every two weeks and they can go there and uh, it's called the Macro Compass. So if you Google the Macro Compass Substack, you'll find it and you can sign up and that's the best way to follow me. If you want something a bit more timely than once every two weeks, you can go on Twitter at macroalf is my handle. Um, there expect some tweets and some rants about foreign butchering of Italian cooking traditions. <laughs> uh, you know, I get a bit upset about that, but you know, I'm Italian after all, so please excuse me for that. Well, as somebody who does follow your Twitter closely, yes, folks, if you are either a fan of uh, Neapolitan pizza uh, <laughs> or you're a fan of charts, um, especially charts on what's going on in the bond market, um, that is a great resource. Alf, I can't thank you enough, my friend. Hope we see you again soon. Well, all right. Well, now's the time in the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial uh, to react to what Alf just said. Um, I also want to spend a little bit of time with them talking about the interview with Felix Zuloff that we just released this past weekend, right before this interview with Alf, uh, because that was uh, a very important discussion as well. Um, and then if there's anything else going on in the markets or how they're uh, allocating their portfolio, we'll quickly talk about that too. I'm joined as usual by lead partners from New Harbor Financial, Mike Preston and John Loder. Gentlemen, it's great to see you. Mike, why don't we start with you? Um, Alf, um, clearly says now is a great time, he believes, uh, to, to be getting into bonds. He thinks they're going to have a good year ahead of them. What were the key things you took from the discussion? Hello, Adam. Nice to see you again. Thanks for having us here. Alf talked about bonds. The one key takeaway that I took out of Alf's talk is, is that he's bullish on bonds. The 10-year Treasury note is around uh, 4.25 right now after reaching a high of 5% in October. And I'll tell you, that October low it's probably going to be a low that sticks for sticks for a while in terms of the price of bonds and the high in yields. Um, Long-term bonds really, really got hit hard in this bear market. They lost over 50% from the high. In fact, if you look at TLT and long-term bonds in general, TLT being the exchange-traded fund that holds long-term U.S. bonds, they dropped more than stocks dropped in general back in the 2008-2009 recession. So 
it was an absolute bloodbath. And the low that we saw in October probably is going to stick for a while. And so that caused yields to go from about 5% to 4.25%. But Alf just said in his talk that he thinks that yields could go to 2% on the 10-year in a recession. And indeed, he sees a recession coming. Part of the reason he sees that is because refinancing costs are going way up. Sure, there's people out there going from one overpriced home to another home, overpriced home, and that's and they're paying cash, and that's keeping the housing market aloft. But as refinancing costs start to eat away at the at the profitability of corporations, and it's going to happen, it's also going to hurt refinancing the the U.S. debt. So the Treasury is going to have to deal with that. But the refinancing costs should sh should be a catalyst or one of the many catalysts that cause a recession either next year or the year after. I think it's coming sooner. It's been somewhat forestalled this year because of easing uh, standards and, and and rules on banks after the bank crisis. So, um, but should, should come next year and the 10 year probably hits 2% in that case. So that means that bonds are still a good opportunity. So I don't, I don't really hear him saying they're a screaming buy like they were a couple months ago, but you know, they're a good buy right here. I'm going to share a chart just to show you TLT, a little bit of what we're talking about. I'm going to move this off the, the page. Here's a, a daily chart of TLT. It hit this capitulation low, and it's been pretty much bound by this uptrend channel. Getting a little bit overbought as it approached the 50-day moving average. The other uh, red line is a 200-day moving average, but it's been pretty contained. It wouldn't be surprising to see TLT to come back to 90 or 92. You know, maybe that offers a good entry point hedge for people that don't already own it. We actually hedged half of our position right around here, 90, 92. We brought in some premium. So our hedge on half of our position sits right around this line. But longer term, TLT probably goes to you know, 110 to 140. I mean, if ALF is right, we probably go even higher. You know, the 10-year yield at 2% would put, you know, TLT back up here somewhere at 140. So this is the weekly chart. But zooming in, um, it's probably got a little bit ahead of itself and can consolidate a little bit. ALF talked a little bit about a few other things uh, of which I'll, I'll mention here. Uh, he talked about as, as well as bonds, he talked about emerging markets. Just a quick look at emerging markets. If we look at the largest emerging market, broad emerging market ETF, and we look at a monthly chart, it's gone nowhere since 2006. This is EEM. So it's had some highs and some lows, but the valuation on this market, uh, on these markets is, is very, very good with a Schiller price earnings um, uh, ratio somewhere in the teens. The S&P is closer to 35 to 40. You know, he mentioned Poland as a specific example. You know, I'm not so sure about Poland in particular, but emerging markets being you know, at very good valuations is the, the main reason why most of our equities are in emerging markets. Our model is up to about 27% stocks. 15% of that is in emerging markets. And we look at sp uh, particular countries like Brazil, India, and Mexico, all of which we have a position. We're also looking at Japan, we'll get a little bit into that later. Um, and we have a broad emerging market ETF. We also have hedges uh, with out of the money puts on the S&P so that if the whole market comes down, that we'll have some protection there. But emerging markets, we absolutely agree. Lastly, Alf talked about investing in your own communication skills. I think that's great advice. You know, investing in yourself, investing in your relationships, that kind of thing makes sense. But that's what I took out of Felix's talk, bonds, probably not a straight up move, but dollar cost averaging in if you're not already there, it makes a lot of sense and emerging markets. I don't think I heard him say this, but, I, but I'm assuming that cash is a big portion of what he's doing as well. And it's also a big portion of what we're doing. It's our biggest position. Okay. Um, and when you say cash, you, you mean largely sort of cash equivalents like short term US Treasury bills, right, that you're getting a return on. Short-term U.S. Treasury bills, we've been extending out a little bit, up to about one year, but you know we're essentially 40% 40, 40 or so in Treasury bills at present, you know, roughly, because you have to have some dry powder to do something different. 
uh, if we get some kind of crash from here. Although, and, and maybe John or I will talk about this a little later, short-term indicators say that a further pop is likely in, in equity markets. So, but you're getting paid 5% to wait. So unless you're getting better than 5% and any other ideas, doesn't make much sense not to have some treasury bills. Yeah. All right. Well, look, I want to, um, uh, I want to dig a little bit deeper into this on the bond side because I want to I want to compare and contrast um, Alf with a few other folks that have recently been on this channel. But what I took away from uh, you know Alf's outlook is he thinks that I think he thinks that things are going to be pretty darn good for bonds for all the reasons that you mentioned. But but one that you didn't, Mike, which I thought was a big part of his focus, which was um, hey, look the 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 bond whales um, are going to be stepping in. This coming year, in in his opinion, because um, he thinks that folks are going to wake up to the fact that inflation is headed down towards the Fed target here. Uh, it is not going to be the problem that it was in the past, um, and uh, that as folks begin to realize, okay, well, as inflation expectations come down, then bond yields should come down. Then I want to lock in these tasty, you know, relatively high measured by past couple of decades. Uh, bond yields right now, right? And so you have all these big players that are all of a sudden going to start trying to scramble to the market and say, hey, before yields go any lower, I want to try to lock them in in this, you know, four plus world, right? Because may maybe maybe the peak is in, maybe I missed the 5%, uh, you know, tenure, uh, but I'll, I'll tr still try to lock it in at four and a quarter or whatever, right? So um, obviously, as those people come in and buy bonds, uh, that'll push up the price and therefore continue to bring down yields. And again, that's 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 not even including a recession, right? And then he says you get a recession in the mix, as you just said, you think is is more likely for next year than not. Uh, then it just becomes game on in terms of how low yields can go. Um, so I thought that that was really yeah. interesting. Um, I want to I want to contrast that to um, you know we've had some other people on the channel um, who aren't interested in touching bonds, right? You know that they're just saying, look, I I I think inflation is going to be stickier. Uh, than folks imagine. I think we're in a new secular era of higher interest rates. Um, and, uh, you know, th they just think that, you know, bonds are to be avoided at this point, particularly the long duration, um, you know, short term T-bills. Yeah, no problem. But going out in duration, that, that that's a bad, uh, bad recipe. And then you have folks like Felix Zuloff, and I'm going to want to talk with you guys a little bit more about Felix's um, specific predictions. But he thinks that bond yields are going to come down, but he's basically saying, you know, it's going to be messy enough that it's not really a main part of his value play for next year. He's just like, I'm going to leave that for more aggressive people. Um, but just to summarize what he thinks, he thinks that bonds are going to, bond yields will continue to come down to around 3.7-ish or so by the end of Q1, which is when he sees the stock market making a new high. But then he sees the wheels start coming off and he thinks that bond yields could go higher in the short term, um, maybe to a to a new um, a new high for the year uh, or at least the past 12 months, get up to maybe the 5.5 percent range on the 10 year um, and then then head down to like the 3 percent range by the end of the year as it's you know, the markets are correcting hard. He expects the S&P to go down 40 percent um, and, uh, you know, recession to kick in. Now the game changes going into 2025 because that's when the central bank rescue efforts really start goosing everything. But even though he sort of got that general arc for the bonds, uh, bond market, he's like, I'm not really going aggressively out on duration because there's just too much uncertainty, and I feel like I could get really kind of knocked off, uh, you know, knocked off my trajectory there if it ends up following a different path than I think it's going to. So he's kind of like, you know, gingerly participating in it if at all. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm curious, Mike, if you could just give me your thoughts on what you guys at New Harbor generally think the arc for bonds are going to be, and and what are you doing with your portfolio on the longer end uh, of, of the duration curve? Yeah, Felix's talk was very good, and and like you said, he's gingerly long bonds because he expects you know perhaps a drop to to three seventy five. I I just said that I agree with Alf that I think ultimately we deal with a recession and and maybe worse, and that during some kind of panic or deflationary scare that 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 bond yields on the 10 year can go down to 2%. That means that I think that there's quite a bit more upside, but Felix ha had a good point. He's like the bullish positioning in long-term bonds is a little bit disconcerting and it's something we're noticing as well. Right? There's there's been no real capitulation. There's there's a lot of bullishness still in that 
space, which is kind of surprising seeing that bonds have fallen more than 50%. But we would agree with Felix that we're, we're not married to this trade. This is a trade, not a long-term investment. And I think that's essentially what he said. You know, and we're only about 10%, maybe 12% in the long-term bond. So it's not a huge position. And we use options quite a lot. We were surprised by how fast we fell into October, but we defrayed a good portion of that with our hedges. We had in the money puts that we have since taken some profit on. So I believe, I believe that if yields do what Felix said, and that is go down to 375, that we'll be able to play that pretty well. Our plan is to keep this position on, to have some options around uh, around that position so that we can hopefully make some money on the options as well. But you know, if if the 10-year yield goes to 375, then I would expect you know TLT, for instance, to, to get to the high 90s, maybe even 100. So there's some money to be made there. Long-term, more than two years out, I don't think we want to be in long-term bonds because I think the end game of all of this is you know, a monetary panic uh, where, where the Fed just, you know, responds to what is likely a hard landing. Another thing that Felix said, um, we're probably going to see surprise. It's not going to be some soft landing equilibrium where we just kind of all, you know, dance away into the sunset. It's probably going to be some kind of crisis and shock. The ultimate response to that is going to be, I think, money printing like we've never seen and inflation. We don't want to be in bonds during that time. So, you know, maybe between now and a year and a half from now, I think that we can do well riding the trend of long-term bonds, which is likely to be higher, but messy. It will not be a straight line, not a V-shaped recovery. There's probably too much bullish positioning for that. Um, but, you know, I think with options and the way that we can hedge, we can ride that pretty well. So modestly bullish, not going to be a straight line and not forever, probably not uh, more than two years. Okay, great. Thanks. John, let me pull you in here. Um, curious, we just talked an awful lot about both Alf and, and Felix. So I guess first, do you want to add into anything here that Mike said? Yeah, I'll emphasize uh, a couple of points. Uh, and Mike pointed out that our position in long-term bonds is a fairly modest one, 10 to 15%. And that that probably says in, in words, everything you need to know about our conviction in terms of how, how big an opportunity this is. I think one of the key... Um, aspects of this debate and I and both Alf and Felix and, and folks uh on both sides of the equation here have some very compelling arguments. I think one aspect here that we probably need to kind of bring into the fold is 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 kind of the last decade and and the form of stimulus um was really off the charts. And in some ways maybe we need to recalibrate ourselves a little bit. So for example, when when the Federal Reserve started QE, which basically is what gave rise to the, 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 the steep decline in longer term bonds because you know, they were essentially printing money to go out and buy uh, treasury and mortgage bonds. Uh, in leading into 2008, their, their balance sheet was 800 billion, okay? After QE, it was over 4 trillion. And then after, you know, so we have a little different situation here in terms of um, the capacity of balance sheets and also the, the, the just sheer amount of debt in the system. Uh, it's not perhaps so easy for uh, an, an immediate return to quantitative easing. In fact, I think there's a valid point to be said that, you know, if we do get a major recession or worse, perhaps the form of stimulus is going to be more in the form of direct payments to consumers rather than through this mechanism of the bond market. And that could actually be quite inflationary. And I, I just want to share a couple of charts that put this in, in, in perspective. Um, so this is a long-term chart of the 10-year Treasury bond. You know, Felix, for example, called for, uh, in the near term, maybe the 10-year to continue declining from 4.2, 4.25 to about 3.7. That's like right around here. Um, you know, and if you go back, so these low interest rates on long-term bonds has really been a mostly relegated to just this decade of QE. And in fact, if you go back to prior recessions, not only have interest rates bottomed at or, at or healthily above where we are right now, there are actually periods like, for example, the 70s, where they, they actually rose, for example, during this recessionary period. And here kind of chopped sideways. So this notion that recession means automatically interest rates decline is, is, is a little bit too convenient, I think, uh, uh, maybe anchored into the recent past. And then this next chart is, is one that John Hussman put together. And this just right. simply it, shows... It, 
And sorry, John, sorry, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I think the reason why it's it's Ooh. anchored <laughs> now is because of the central planner response. It's not that bond yields should rise in a recession. It's right. that bond yields, or, sorry, should fall in a recession. It's that they should fall once the central planners respond to the recession. That's correct. And, and I guess it's a valid debate as to how they may respond, right? Whether it's right. through buying bonds again or getting monies into, into you know, let's not forget we have stock valuations that are uh, near record highs, if you go back in all of history, and depending on how you look at it. Um, that wasn't the case in 2009 when QE was 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 launched, right? Technically 2013. Um, different set of circumstances. But even looking at recessions, you know, this is a chart that, you know, John Hussman put together. It basically just shows that um, yields don't tend to drop meaningfully until sometimes, uh, you know, a year into a recession, right? So it's, it's um, there's a lot of nuance here, and, and um, that's that's really I think why we are um, kind of being very cautious about getting too overloaded on on, on these. And we're you know let's not forget there the, a month ago we were talking about legitimate buyer strikes on, on bonds, and so much so the Fed uh, the Treasury kind of wigged out and actually um, basically did a did a market favor and said hey we're gonna we're gonna continue funding via short term Treasury bills rather than longer term bonds because of you know, perhaps some of the the scare that was in the bond market going to be a really interesting. I think I think Felix's um, you know kind of theory or or path here with a very choppy up and down bond market is probably a pretty good um, you know uh, picture to to be thinking about. Yeah, and and it's also too it just underscores um, the folly of kind of investing according to the headline du jour. Um, they, they they tend to present a picture of oh my gosh the world is is for absolutely certain heading in, in a certain direction. And then all of a sudden, you know, a month or two later, it can turn on a dime. <laughs> and what looked like a certainty is now the contrary position to take. Um, I also just want to note too, that um, we've railed about this in the past, but the fact that um, so much of the, the investing community is trying to figure out, okay, so if there's a recession, what are the central planners going to do? That really forces you from being an investor who is looking at business cycles and the fundamentals of the companies themselves and forces you to be a speculator about what is a small group of humans around a table going to do. And the fact that so much, the major, the vast majority probably of the investing community has been forced to become speculators for that exact reason of the, hey, the central banks really at the end of the day, they're, they're directing the action. Um, it's just a really sad commentary on the state of our financial markets. You're sort of nodding grimly as I'm saying this, John. Yeah, it's been a, a tragedy, I think, for all of us. We Maybe we don't all realize it yet, but uh, markets have been utterly uh, corrupted, distorted by, you, you take you take interest rates, the, the very lifeblood of, of the capitalistic system and drive them to, to zero or even negative in many parts of the world. You're going to get some pretty distorted and, and um, unhealthy things in, in, the, in the system. And I think we're still working through those and probably will be for, for many years to come. Okay. All right. Well, look... Um... Yeah, so you know, Felix. Uh, let's just assume for a moment that Felix's game book for next year proves correct. Um, that is going to be a highly disruptive year. I mean, we're talking uh, first. You know, people probably getting to an elated state of new highs on the S and P S and P five thousand, like you said, right? Uh, and then uh, just a total nose over. And, uh, you know, again, no guarantees on this, but but assume for a moment that we do in the year at 3000. And so in three quarters, essentially, the S&P loses 40 percent of its value. And a big part of that is going to be weakness in the Magnificent Seven, you know, which you talked about in terms of how how they're over owned. Right. So the collateral damage of that um, is is going to be tremendous because so much of the investing community is is exposed to those stocks. What would that world look like? I want to stick with you just for a second, John, then we'll come to you, Mike. Well, you know, and, and sorry, in your answer, how would you guys plan to navigate it? Yeah, well, chaotic is 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 I think one word. Uh, but we've been here before, right? Um, this isn't the first kind of episode where we've had very uh, extreme bubble valuations that seem like they uh, are never going to matter. Um, you know, perhaps this this time has been a bit more extended. Um, and we, we've we've seen episodes like this before. In fact, I'm going to share another chart of, of John Hussman's just because it's it's so good. I think 
And this, I think, puts a lot of that into perspective. Um, so this chart goes back to 1928. And let's take Felix's um, call for uh, a 40% decline-ish off the, off the top. Now, taken in a vacuum, it's easy to say, hey, drop stocks could drop 40%. Um, but understand that the, there's precedent from wh when we get to valuations like we're in right now. It's not, if there's one tragedy, is this idea that markets are a flip of a coin, that there's, you have no um, kind of basis on which to have a, 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 a better ability to predict big declines versus big, big, big uh, rises. And in fact, when you look at big declines in history, they come from the very set of overvaluations we have, like right now. Doesn't mean they come right away. In fact, they're oftentimes delayed. And that's what this chart shows. This this chart is a uh, little little complicated, but I'll try and simplify it. Um, this blue line is basically the the level, the valuation derived level uh, of, of a decline in the S&P 500 that would be needed to be historically consistent with a perspective return of, uh, let's say, 10% in the S&P 500. And that's this is John Hussman's model, and it's it basically based upon actual data, uh, historical data. And the red is the actual um, worst drawdown in, in, in a three-year period. You can see right here. And you can see over history, this is going back to 1928, 29, uh, virtually every situation ultimately sees this projected uh, decline needed to be to get back to kind of normal valuations. Ultimately, it gets filled or has been filled historically speaking. Now there are periods where uh, this white space is is basically indicative of, hey, these valuations don't matter. Uh, the market's not going to sell off because it doesn't matter anymore. And in fact, this latest episode has been more extreme and extended uh, than than ever before. But it's a pretty big wager, we think, to be saying it. That doesn't. That means it doesn't matter. In fact, we think it probably matters all the more. And combine that with the real challenge that our clients have. It's not you know posting ten-year annual returns on some mutual fund um, fact sheet. It's hey, is, is my money going to be here to provide the kind of returns I need to provide for uh, my living? And I have a, a chart I can show you here. If we actually look at the timing of of returns. You, know, you take, for example, the 25-year period of uh, if you had retired in 1973 and looked at the actual returns over the next 25 years, that was a devastating period because the 73-74 was a very nasty two-year bear market. You simply reverse the sequence of the, those returns. In other words, the 1997, 1996 are the first two years and 1974, 1973 are the last two years. Um, dramatically different results in terms of how likely the the nest egg is is to be able to sustain itself and provide a client what they need during their retirement. So that's really where this this really hits home for us and our clients. It's not about projecting returns just for the sake of doing it. It's about hey, can our clients um, is their nest egg going to be sufficient to provide what they need when they need it? Yeah. Um, so it's you know definitely speaks to why sitting down with a financial advisor and doing a financial plan and doing the scenario planning is just so important, right? So you can see, um, you know, where the vulnerabilities lie um, in terms of timing of when you make certain different decisions. Um, and, and folks, if you're watching and you haven't uh, created a financial plan yet with an advisor, or if it's been a couple of years, I highly recommend you do that as we get into the end of the year and you're trying to, you know, hopefully start 2024 um, on a sound financial footing. Um, that chart from Hussman there is a scary one, John, because it basically says to Felix, hey, I'll take your 40% decline and I'll raise you <laughs> because it seems to predict about maybe a two thirds decline based upon the current model. Um, that's, that's actually what that says. But John Hussman would also be the first one to say it doesn't mean it, you know, a, a, a uh, you know, a scenario where we don't get down to those those levels of sell offs. It likely just means from a, from a mathematical standpoint that the subsequent returns are just not going to be that compelling. They're not going to be 10% annually. Maybe three or four is, is where we top out. That's, that's really what that means. And, and uh, you know. Yeah. And, and we've shown the scatter plot from, from John often that shows the projected 12-year return in the S&P based upon today's current level of valuations. And that still is negative. Right, it's something like negative four percent or five percent for the per year for the next four years. Somewhere in that ballpark, yeah. Yeah, which could be a massive drawdown, you know, uh, and then rebuilding from there. Or to your point, it just could just be a slow grind down, right? Just just a, losing a couple of points a year uh, for the next twelve, which would be just you know, pretty miserable for folks' prospects as well. 
Um, all right. So um, who knows if that's all going to happen? Um, again, that's why we have you guys on this channel every week uh, so that we can be looking at the, the action as it is developing week to week and, you know, help audibly guide folks as to what's going on. You guys will share your decision making process for us. Um, we got to start wrapping it up here. Mike, um, anything else on your guys' end in terms of new positions you guys have taken or um, plannings that you guys have with your portfolio uh, heading into the end of the year here? And I guess in your answer too, if you don't mind, um, is there anything you would recommend viewers do given the fact that we are now just a couple of a weeks from the end of the year here in terms of just tidying up their finances for 2023? Well, I'll try to respond to that briefly. In terms of year-end things, um, definitely want to look at gain-loss situation. You can you know, take a $3,000, which seems ridiculously low, by the way, a $3,000 maximum loss against income and unlimited amounts against capital gains. So take a look at gain-loss. We're certainly doing that here and uh, are going to do our best to net out um, you know, to either no gain or a slight loss. So people don't have to worry about that. But individuals should be doing that. Charitable giving makes sense. As you enter, um, you know, at the end of the year, you can give up to $100,000 directly out of an IRA if you're, um, you know, basically if you're taking required minimum distributions already. There, there's a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, but those are, those are really the two big ones in terms of year-end stuff. Happy to talk to anybody, um, you know, that wants to wants to chat about that. I guess one other thing that we're very busy with right now, I should mention, is Roth conversions. If you're in the low bracket, if you're a married filer earning less than eighty nine thousand adjusted gross income, that puts you in the twelve percent bracket. And so, Roth conversions, if you're in the twelve percent bracket, are almost a no brainer up to that limit, up to that cap of roughly eighty nine thousand for 2023 and it's half that for single filers. So some people are in that situation. They may have low income or they may have retired early but aren't taking social security yet. So it's a really common conversation that we're having. If you're in that bracket now, but it may be going up later, think about doing that Roth conversion this year as we've got just a couple of weeks left. Hey, sorry, Mike, just for the folks that might not know what you mean by Roth conversion, can you just give a quick description of that? Sure. A traditional IRA is funded with money that gets uh, that goes in pre-tax. That is, you get a tax deduction for it. Or if it goes into a 401k at work, you don't get taxed on that money at all. So that traditional IRA or 401k is all money that's never been taxed. When you ultimately take it out and you have to start taking it out with required minimum distributions at age 73, that, that age is ultimately going up. But, you know, roughly 73, when you take it out, it's taxable as ordinary income at whatever tax bracket you're in. A Roth IRA or Roth 401k, by comparison, is money that's post-tax and it never gets taxed. As long as it's been open five years, all the principal and growth in the Roth IRA is completely tax-free. Technically, the principal is always tax-free, but the, the key is the growth in that Roth IRA is completely tax-free for the rest of your life. You never have to take required minimum distributions either, which is important to some people. So if it's important to you to never take required minimum distributions and to leave a legacy, perhaps for the kids, um, if you live to age 100, you don't even have ever have to touch that until they inherit it. So it's powerful. I mean, I'm not that crazy about paying taxes now versus later but if you're in the 12 percent bracket it's kind of a no-brainer so wanted to put that out there and if i could just close by saying one or two things about uh, more about what uh, felix said it i'd love to do that Go for it. um this is an environment that hurts everybody it's a very it, you know it's it's a very unsafe market it's not a real market hasn't been for quite a long time with quantitative easing. And we tend to agree with what Felix is seeing and that we probably have a move higher here. All of our indicators have been lining up, pointing to the upside. We hate to admit it, but that's what's going on. We reduced hedges and added a little bit to our stocks because of it. So we're presently at 4,600 on the S&P. Felix says that maybe we go to 4,900 or 5,000, a new high ultimately dropped to 3,000, which is a big drop, 40%, and then double again from there to 6,000. So what a sickening ride that is. 
you know, and unfortunately that hurts everybody because if we pop to new highs, it's going to suck even more money in with through fear of missing out or FOMO. And, and generally speaking, people won't sell. They'll, they'll sell perhaps down at the lows, a lot of people, unfortunately, and then only to watch it double from there and jump back in. The Fed has created this unstable market. It's really not good and it's going to hurt people. And it's really a case for active management. We have increased our stocks a little bit, like I said, but the real key is going to be getting in on the way down when we have a kind of a layering system where we will add tactical positions at key points with hedges. We will not be perfect. That's why we use options to kind of um, you know, approximate our entry, entries and it's a lot more forgiving. And by the way, even if we do reach 3,000, there's nothing that says that we can't lose another 50% from there down to 1,500. I'm not predicting it, but in fact, 1,500 would only be a level that would yield maybe 10 to 12% expected returns on the S&P over the next decade. That's how crazy it's gotten. So having that skill to get in, having the patience to get in, having the options to hedge, I think will be important. Being an active investor will be important. Ironically, it's the opposite of what worked in the last 10 to 15 years. All you had to do is blindly hold and never sell which has been very frustrating because we've been dealing with a relatively permanently overvalued market all of these years. This time has been different and that this set of conditions has persisted then longer than ever before. But it's for all those reasons that I think that the ultimate trap is, is potentially here for people that are just, you know, buy and hold investors. So, you know, active management, patience, layering in those types of things I think will be important. Very well said, Mike. Um, you're reminding me that maybe next time um, when you guys are on uh, next week, we could talk a little bit about the bullwhip effect um, because I think it can help people understand um, why we're so concerned about sort of lag effects that we haven't that haven't arrived yet and have taken a while to arrive. Um, but when you pull liquidity in and out um, the way that the Fed has done here with its uh, rate hiking regime, its historically unprecedented rate hike regime, after a historically unprecedented amount of stimulus going into the economy. Um, I think it'll help folks really understand why we're so concerned about the scope of what could be, what really probably is very likely lying ahead of us because of the bullwhip effect, but don't have time for that this week. So we'll have to save that for next. Um, all right, gents, we'll look as I wrap up here. Very quickly, folks, if you've enjoyed this interview with Alf and with the return of the folks here from New Harbor Finance uh, Financial, do me a favor, uh, let them know by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below. Close that little bell icon right next to it. And just a reminder, because the channel is still so new, the growth in our subscribers actually really does matter in terms of the love that we get from the YouTube al algorithms. So if you can help us out, please do hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Um, don't forget, if you're interested in um, ALF's bond course, uh, to go look at the link uh, right below this video, right at the beginning of the description. Uh, you can go learn more about the course there. And as, as uh, ALF said, if you're one of the first uh, folks to sign up for it, you get that nice discount. Um, just a reminder to folks, too, that I have resumed my practice of publishing my Adams notes, which are basically my Cliff's notes uh, to these uh, interviews that we do. So if you want to get mine for all the uh, interview, all the interviews I've done on the new Thoughtful Money channel and all the ones I'll be doing going forward, including this one with Alf and, and especially the one that we just did with Felix, uh, go to my Substack at adamtaggart.substack.com. Uh, there's a lot of information you can get there for free, uh, subscribing for free. But if you want to get those Adam's notes, uh, the premium subscribers get them and they're not much at all, folks. I think they're like eight bucks a month. It comes to something like 50 cents a note or something like that. Um, all right. Well, look, um, John, Mike, thank you guys so much for another week. Look forward to seeing you next week. Um, folks, if you have not yet watched that interview with Felix, I'll put up a link to it right here. Um, beyond that, everyone else, thanks so much for watching.